God is good. And all the time, God is good. This is yet to come. I can say that because we're going to allow God's word to preach today and hear from him. So glad to see you in the house of our Lord. This morning, we've begun by focusing on the majesty of Christ. The church was then called to rise up. And then our focus turned to our own responsibility to be active in that which most pleases the heart of Christ. And so all of this is intent and purpose for one thing. We have a grand announcement to make today. And I'm excited about this announcement. And it comes from the scriptures. In fact, you've heard these verses read already. And they should inspire us with, with all of what God does through his people. But certainly this should call us to focus indelibly upon the kingdom of Christ. You read and heard just a moment ago this grand summary at the very end of the book of Acts. Have Paul stayed two years in his place of house arrest and all came to visit him, heard him proclaim the kingdom of God and he taught the things concerning Christ. Uh, for a moment, uh, may we focus on why this is such a successful story. Uh, consider with me for a moment the power of a vision. Uh, if you have your Cell phones, put your hand on it for just a moment. I bet you've never heard a pastor say that before. <laughs> I want to give you an example of vision that you could possibly wrap your hand around. And then we're going to elevate it to the greatest vision known to man. But if you consider the cell phone for just a moment, and I hope yours is like mine in the off position. But if you consider the, uh, slip that in there. If you uh, consider that just three decades ago, three decades ago, the chairman of IBM said there would only ever need to be in the world market five computers. Just in 1977, the president of digi digital technology made this announcement. Most people would never need nor want a computer in their home. Uh, they missed it just a little bit, did they not? Because not only do we want computers in our homes when our handheld computers go missing, we go nuts, don't we? I, I've seen people really act up because they can't find uh, their phone. The power of a vision is represented by what you're holding in your hand because most of us know the story of Steve Jobs and how he sold his Volkswagen for $1,300 to, to found a company that has changed the world. And as his company began to emerge, he realized he needed management expertise. So he called John Scully, the CEO of Pepsi, and he invited Scully to join his ambitious goal to not only market, but to see this company, newly named Apple, become successful. Well, Scully obviously turned him down, but Steve Jobs continued to persist. And finally, Jobs won Scully over with this one statement. Uh, my dear friend Scully, as quoted from, from the exchange, you can spend your life selling sugar water or you can join me and change the world. Well, that did it for Scully, obviously. And hence you have the uh, evidence of the power of, of a vision. But this can't even begin to describe the power of the most important vision ever given to man. Now, this pales in comparison, and that, that's even an understatement. Because the greatest vision ever given to man came from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. When he said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. This was his vision, not just for those few that were adding themselves to his following on that day he spoke these words. Now, this was a vision for everyone who would understand Jesus' position as Messiah and as King of the world and King of the universe. God's only Son come to mirror God's heart to all of mankind is the purpose and the power of the vision to which Jesus pointed everyone. Seek first the kingdom of God. He not only spoke this vision, but he alluded to this vision over and over again in his earthly ministry by saying it is, is my calling to come and to preach the kingdom of God. Jesus said this many times, like in Matthew 4 and in Matthew 9. Jesus pointed his disciples to the greatest calling on his heart, which was to do the will of the Father. And the will of the Father, Jesus said, was to proclaim his kingdom until Jesus returns. 
And Jesus then passed this vision on to his disciples turned apostles. And the vision has fallen to you, to me. And so we read in Acts chapter 28, verse 31, a grand summary of the church and her embrace of this vision of the kingdom. We are told that Paul spent two years in a rented house, and yet the gospel was unhindered. We are told that historically Paul is under classic house arrest as it pertains to the Roman government. Paul could not leave these quarters even though they belonged to him in some right as he awaited his appearance before Caesar to plea his case that Felix suggested he plea back in Acts chapter 26. And here sat Paul awaiting for his moment to appear before Caesar, not unbecoming to the vision that God had given Paul when the angel said to Paul, you must appeal before Caesar. And so Paul is waiting in this place of house arrest, chained to a guard, and yet the scripture says that Paul's proclamation of the kingdom was unhindered. The word unhindered is the very last word of the very last verse of the chronicled history of the forming of the church, the book of Acts. And the last word is unhindered. Now, why is it important that we focus here upon this small yet very conclusive statement of success of Paul's life? Because herein we can truly understand not only the kingdom, but we can also understand the church's role, our place in pointing people to the kingdom of Christ. I love this word unhindered. For it comes from our Greek text, kaluthos, meaning to press back and to hold back. But here it's akaluthos, meaning the opposite of being held back and being hindered or restrained. We are told that when Paul was teaching people the gospel for these two years, every word and every passionate plea that Paul taught about God's kingdom in Christ was unhindered. It was not pressed back. Now certainly there were episodes leading up to this moment wherein I'm sure Paul felt extremely pushed back. His journey from Caesarea to Rome as chronicled from chapters 26 to 28 represent not only a physical and, and a relational suffering, but also represents such episodes of, of tragedy like a shipwreck or a snake bite. And yet none of this served to push back and hinder Paul's proclamation of the kingdom. In fact, these episodes only serve to advance the kingdom even further. As we witness throughout the chronicling of Acts, that the message of the kingdom of God found in Christ moved from Jerusalem through Antioch and eventually, according to this verse, to Rome. As Paul was finishing up his letter to the Christians in Rome while he was in Corinth, he said passionately, I long to see you. God allowed that passion to become a vision as Paul knew it was God's will that the kingdom of God found in the beloved Son be expressed as far from Jerusalem as the Roman Empire. And here sits Paul chained inside of a rented house that was given to him. We're not sure if his own proceeds secured this house or if others raised money for him. But this was semi-personal property, yet inside he was chained, restricted only miles from the emperor. A fierce an uh, unsympathetic emperor to the Christian faith. And here is Paul, just miles from him, being given the freedom to proclaim that which he desired, the kingdom of God. And his proclamation of the kingdom was unhindered. You'll notice something about this statement of the kingdom in the closing of the book of Acts. If you were to refer back to verse 23, you'll see another reference to the kingdom of God as we uh, microscopically move in from the summary passage of verse 31 down to a, a, a more uh, chronicled event in verse 23 where Paul is entertaining the guests that are coming in and th there were at least two waves of Jews coming to see him and scripture says from morning to evening Paul proclaimed the kingdom most would 
would see this historically as a time frame of eight to ten hours, almost uninterrupted, that Paul taught people about the kingdom of God. And what a phenomenal success we read that becomes for you and me an incredible teaching point, but also an incredible challenge that we might rethink our understanding of what is meant in the scriptures pertaining to the kingdom of God. And that we might face this third of three questions that we have had before us these days concerning church and vision. For we have asked, what is our real story? Secondly, who belongs to our story? But thirdly, here's the question, what is the ultimate story? And as Paul would say, even as he did on the day recorded here, the ultimate story is the story of the kingdom of God demonstrated in Jesus Christ. Now, if that's confusing to you, wherein you might say, I thought the apex of a story was the local church, not the kingdom, then I want you to understand that what we're about to discover is not only our place in the kingdom, but our understanding of what it means, say, as a church, we want to promote and proclaim the kingdom of God. In fact, I find here some truths that will help us to think like the kingdom of God so that we might discover those encouraging words and statements that will truly lead us forward as the people of God unhindered. So I want to share with you from verses 30 and 31, as well as from the context back to verse 23, six truths that will help us to think like the kingdom. The first of these can be listed as such. As the passage opens in verse 30, Paul stayed there two whole years. I'm reminded first that a kingdom-focused ministry requires consistency. I don't want to say that again. A kingdom-focused ministry requires consistency. Paul stayed how many years? Two. 24 months at a minimum. And as he's proclaiming the gospel, possibly through windows, with, with at least one, possibly two, chain men uh, holding him in place, Paul has success. He stayed there. He was content to be completely at ease and at peace with seeing the gospel go forward. And part of this represents that verse in Philippians that says it was made known throughout the whole Proterian guard that my chains were for the purpose of the gospel. He was being allowed to speak. And he kept this consistent posture for two years. What caused him to stay in that place? What is the cause for you and for me to stay consistent in our call to serve the kingdom? For at times, I am sure we could all testify to the smallest of events that would push us back from that which we should be committed to for the kingdom of God. So what held Paul consistently committed in that house arrest to proclaiming the kingdom? Well, I believe the answer to this is back in verse 23 where we read, After arranging a day with him, many came at his lodging, from dawn to dusk, that eight to ten hour period, and he, watch this, he expounded and he witnessed about the kingdom and he persuaded all of them concerning the law of Moses. That which kept Paul consistent in such an adverse location is the very same that will keep you and I consistent as God calls us to live for his kingdom. So here we not only find reasons to be consistent, but we find meaning for the kingdom, whereby we can hold on to that which God is doing and not push back, not grow weary, and not give up to that which God has called. And these three words will help us to mirror the same consistency that kept Paul active about proclaiming the kingdom of God. Notice these three words from verse 23. He expounded, he witnessed, and he persuaded. Very quickly, the word expounded simply means to take out of. Paul took out of his sources around him the very evidence of the kingdom, and he taught that. What were his sources? His sources were, first and foremost, he was an eyewitness of what Jesus had done, both in him and other people. Secondly, his sources was his teaching from Gal Gamaliel and the Hebrew culture from which he had his origin whereby he could understand from the prophets and the teachings of Moses' law that all things pointed to Christ. One might say, I don't know that the gospel or Jesus is taught in the Ten Commandments. Well, here the law of Moses doesn't simply represent, uh, represent the commandments. It represents the whole Pentateuch, the, the opening of the Scriptures, the first five books as we would reference. 
became for Paul the Hebraic foundation for which he stood upon as he pointed his fellow Jews to the Messiah and that the Messiah came to fulfill the kingdom of God that had been preached and proclaimed for centuries. So Paul expounded on that which he knew to teach others about the kingdom. But he not only expounded, this is a very important word for us. For us. Secondly, he witnessed. He spoke as a witness. He witnessed about the kingdom. Now, you and I cannot witness about that which we have not seen or experienced. And Paul had indeed experienced the work of the kingdom of God. And here is where we find great definition for what is meant by the kingdom of God. For we read in Scripture, particularly in Luke's Gospel, and I love this phrase, in chapter 16, verse 16, Jesus himself saying, The law and the prophets were up until John the Baptist. Then the good news of the kingdom of God is proclaimed and everyone is strongly urged to enter that kingdom. So Jesus himself gave record that at one time the prophets and the law of Moses proclaimed that which was of God. And now Jesus said, as he entered the scene, now the kingdom of God is being proclaimed. Paul is witnessing to the work of Jesus in his life and in the lives of others, for it announced that God was beginning through Christ a work of establishing his kingdom. And we know his kingdom is not limited to what Paul saw or what we see today, for Scripture very clearly tells us that one day Christ will come and his kingdom will be fully established. But now, before that fulfillment comes, God is at work uh, establishing his kingdom among the lives of people and drawing them into his local fellowship so the church represents the work of the greater message of the gospel throughout the world, the kingdom of God. You and I have seen witness of that, both here in these walls and beyond these walls. We know God is at work in the lives of people. Paul knew that well. He witnessed it. He saw a Roman jailer and his entire family baptized into a following after Christ. He saw members, according to Philippians 4, of the very household of the emperor Caesar come to faith in Christ. Paul understood throughout ethnicities and ethos and throughout many pieces of his civilization that day the work of the kingdom being merged out and expressed in the heart of man. And Paul was giving witness to the work of God in Christ in the lives of people. So he expounded from what he knew. He, he witnessed what he had seen, but he also persuaded people you see that third word in verse 23? He persuaded people to know about the kingdom of God and about who Christ is. He pointed all things to Jesus Christ. There's no other way to announce the kingdom of God than to point exclusively to the work of Jesus on the cross through his resurrection and in his ascension and in his place at the right hand of the Father. So Paul practiced this consistency because he was able to expound and witness and persuade people about the work of the kingdom of God. There's another, another truth we see that will help form our kingdom thinking. Secondly, a kingdom focus has an openness to every opportunity. A, a kingdom-focused ministry has an openness to every opportunity. Paul is in this house arrest posture and scripture says he was there for two years and he experienced success for he proclaimed the kingdom that one might say how could he have success as a prisoner but you understand the kingdom is never about an individual or an individual church the kingdom is much larger and we celebrate what God is doing in the larger sphere and that's why Paul saw the gospel unhindered because he saw God at work in the grand scheme of the gospel in many ways, even beyond his own life and beyond, beyond the particular church that's established in his ministry. But notice, in those two years he stayed there, he welcomed all. I want to ask you to capture that statement for just a moment as we consider that a kingdom-focused ministry is always open to every opportunity that arises that would emphasize in even the smallest way the kingdom of God found in Christ. For Paul is described here as welcoming all who would come in. The word welcome is a wonderful word, and, and I want to share that with you so that it might help posture us to be open and ready for any opportunity God may give us to point people to his kingdom, to point people to Christ, for opportunities abound. 
Uh, someone once said to me, Ken, I, uh, I just don't have time to take advantage of every opportunity that comes up. And I, I said to them, uh, you having the opportunity to point people to Christ and to his kingdom has nothing to do with time, but it has everything to do with how we see ourselves and how we see others. If we see ourselves, as Paul did, as one who could expound and witness the kingdom, and if we see others as an opportunity to know about Christ, then opportunities seem to be a bit more open whereby we might step through. For, again, a kingdom ministry is always open to opportunities to see the gospel advance and grow. And this word welcome, as Paul would welcome all who came, uh, represents an idea of reaching out with the hand. This is a literal descriptive word from the Greek, and taking in. So you can imagine this picture of Paul seeing someone coming to visit him in his house arrest and him reaching out and saying, I'm glad I can talk with you. And receiving and taking opportunity. It hasn't been that recent, perhaps, where someone has spoken to us and we nodded and moved on without entertaining the question, was that an opportunity to point someone to Christ? Perhaps it hasn't been that long ago that we saw a need or felt someone's pain but stuck to our own story and our own movement in life as opposed to saying, how can I take hold of what could be an opportunity to advance God's kingdom as revealed in Christ? You and I have been touched by the Messiah. If we know Jesus and we have an opportunity to point people to his kingdom, to say, look at what? Christ is doing and look at what he has for you. So being open to opportunities is a vital piece of a, of a kingdom-focused ministry. But we move on because not only did we read that Paul stayed there welcoming, but he welcomed all people who came to see him. So this represents a third truth that can shape our kingdom thinking. A kingdom-focused ministry welcomes and serves People. And I know this seems rather practical, but please do not miss this portion of the grand conclusion of Acts. A, a kingdom-focused ministry welcomes and serves people. If someone were to say, what is the goal of a ministry, a church, or an individual that wants to be kingdom-minded, I would say the goal is twofold, to exalt Christ and to love people. Sounds a lot like the Shema of the Hebrew Old Testament. Love the Lord your God and to love your neighbor. For that is the summary of all that God has asked. And when you filter that summary through the words of Christ and through the life of Christ, you understand that Jesus promoting the kingdom of Christ and announcing that the kingdom was here was in large part his ministry to reach out to those who are broken. In fact, Jesus spoke of his own life in Luke 4, 18, when he said, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, quoting Isaiah's prophecy, because he's anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. And he has sent me to proclaim freedom to the captives and recovery to the blind and to set free the oppressed and proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Jesus summarized his own earthly ministry. He summarized his vision about the kingdom by emphasizing the needs of man, the poor, captive, the blind, the oppressed. When Paul welcomed these Jews coming to his house arrest, uh, many say you could see two distinct waves. The first wave would be the general audience of Jews who would have heard him at the synagogue, but could not because he was restricted at his, at his house. And so Paul preached to those who uh, possibly were not buying into his words. In fact, this text in Acts 28 tells us some believed and some didn't. But again, that did not hinder the movement of the proclamation of the kingdom. Church, do you see that even people who would say, no, I don't believe, does not note among the hearts of the obedient a loss. For we have proclaimed the kingdom. And some believed and some didn't. Now, it's certainly a loss of a soul. And we, we cry over that. We, 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 uh, we're so burdened by that. But, but Paul presented a proclamation of the kingdom of God found in Christ that was unhindered because the success was that it was proclaimed. And it was proclaimed to everyone who would come. And the first wave of Jews could have been uh, posited most as Paul's enemies, and yet he proclaimed 10 hours a day, nonstop, 
two years. But then there was a second wave of Jews and maybe a second wave of the populace that was mixed Jews and Gentiles that came. And from this, many people believed in Jesus Christ. So Paul was that welcoming and serving presence of the kingdom as people came, regardless of who they might be, enemies, religious, Gentile, Jew, reprobate. It didn't matter. When they came, they received welcome. And Paul served them as best he could through an opening in a window and teaching them Jesus. Maybe perhaps he entertained some in his home. But in this confined state, he was that grand proponent of the kingdom of Christ because he welcomed and served people. How has it been with us? Is our welcome and service selective based on those we most identify with? How has it been with us? Or could someone say of our lives, even recently, that we're a constant welcoming and serving people? What can be said of me, one might ask? Do I truly represent a welcoming and serving heart that would embrace all others? But we continue to read of this grand summary by noting that after he welcomed all who visited, he then proclaimed the kingdom. So a fourth truth is this about one who desires to be kingdom-focused, even as Paul presents here. A kingdom-focused ministry, fourthly, becomes a proclamation of the truth. Now, certainly we know that. But I want you to understand this word proclamation again. From the word keruso or kerygma comes this word proclamation, meaning that we truly desire that the message be heard before people. There's so many beautiful pieces of the proclamation. Matthew 3 and 1, John the Baptist said, I'm proclaiming the coming of the Messiah and the repentance of sins. That's the beginning of the New Testament proclamation of the kerygma. Jesus said, as we've read in in Luke chapter 4, verse 18, I am preaching repentance of sins and pointing people to the kingdom. In Romans chapter 10, verse 14, I hope you'll note this. We are told... People cannot believe unless they, do you know the next phrase? Unless they hear. They can't hear unless there is a proclamation. Same word, kerygma, caruso. So we must desire that all those that we want to welcome in are hearing the teaching, the proclamation whereby lives are changed. I've, I've never seen the gospel proclaimed where Lives were not changed, even if it was just changed in the heart of the proclaimer. When the gospel is preached, it's either the, either the proclaimer or the ones listening that are going to be changed. The seed is going to come. Isaiah chapter 55 verse 11 is going to come true, wherein God does not allow his word to go forward without it returning that which he purposes. And sometimes I believe we want to share the gospel, but when someone decides not to receive We see failure, but you have no idea where that seed might go and what might become of that seed. We're told to share the news of the kingdom of Christ. and We should become a proclamation of the truth of Jesus. This proclamation represented in John the Baptist teaching and the apostles and in our churches today, the proclamation is of who Christ is, what he's accomplished on the cross, and his teaching and his instructions given through the early church that we might follow him and live for his kingdom. But a fifth truth that helps shape our thinking of kingdom is this. A kingdom-focused ministry always promotes the centrality of the king. Obviously, that could go without being stated, but here it's vital. For we're told that Paul not only proclaimed the kingdom, but he taught the things of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's significant that all three titles are used there. He taught the truth of the Lord. Adonai, the The one who is God, Jesus, the Savior, the one that we knew from Nazareth, but he was God embodied, and he redeemed us in Christ, the one that fulfilled the promises, the Messiah. These three titles represent all that the teachings of Christ represent and form the centrality, the centerpiece of who we are as a people. I love how this affected Paul. In Acts chapter 9, Paul met the Christ on the road to Damascus. In Acts chapter 26, Paul was given a vision again as he gives testimony to Agrippa of that conversion that he had where he said, I have been called to preach 
light to darkness, for God has transformed us uh, uh, from darkness to light. And God's transformed us in that way. And then Paul taught the same truth as recorded in Colossians 1.13. So from Acts 9 to Acts 26.18 to Colossians 1.13, you see this line of the centrality of Christ where Paul truly experienced Christ and then uh, that which Christ done for him became the impetus for his mission and ministry and then he was able to teach this to churches like the church in Colossae. And what a beautiful example of the centrality of the king in Paul's life. And so it is for his people and for you and me, or so it should be, that a kingdom-focused ministry promotes the centrality of our King, Jesus Christ, and what he's done for us and through us to be proclaimed to the world. And then a final truth of kingdom thinking is this, a kingdom-focused ministry, and this is one which you and I together may find quite encouraging. A kingdom-focused ministry creates a liberating confidence in the members of the kingdom. For this final phrase of the grand summary of the book of Acts tells us this, that as he proclaimed the kingdom and taught the things of the Lord Jesus Christ, he did so with full boldness, and here's our word we began with, without hindrance. So I find something very reassuring here that, that there is a liberating confidence and boldness that comes to the heart of one who truly desires to proclaim the kingdom of God found in Christ. Why is this called a liberating confidence? For the word boldness here actually means to be free. Isn't that refreshing? There is in the core of this word the idea of freedom to support and defend that which is most important. And although in chains inside of house arrest, Paul had a liberating confidence. He preached like a free man. He proclaimed because he was confident of what Christ has done. I find myself joining you and wanting to ask a very particular question. How does all of this apply to me personally and to our church? I give you these three statements. Consider that which binds us. Consider that which leads us. And consider that which compels us. That which binds us is the community of faith represented inside the kingdom of God. You and I are bound together not because we might share church membership, but because we share citizenship in the kingdom of God. And that is a tight bind. That which leads us is the faith in Christ that develops so that we not only are followers, but we are proclaimers of the Messiah. And we become, in our own right, as God has redeemed us, ministers of the gospel. And that which compels us is love. A heartbeat of urgency to see other people know the Christ that has changed us. That which binds us, the community of citizens of the kingdom, that which leads us, the faith development from being citizens to be in proclaimers of the kingdom of Christ and that which compels us, love for God and love for others that need to know the truth of Christ. This becomes our ultimate story. And this becomes that which awakens us to represent the kingdom of Christ and through our local body of believers to serve Christ with a fervor and a passion because of what he's done for us. And to know that our confidence is built upon his work and his kingdom. Not anything that's felt and that is temporal or tangible, but that which he is doing throughout the world. May God be praised as his people arise, as his church arises, and represents Christ and the kingdom of God to a world that so desperately needs to know him. May we stand for prayer.